The top players in the world have gathered this week. One will earn the title Champion of Champions. It's the most prestigious event on the Pro Bowlers Tour. Tonight, eight players will battle it out. It's the final round of the Brunswick World Tournament of Champions. Zone Deer Park Lanes in Deer Park, Illinois, just outside Chicago for the pinnacle of bowling. It's the Brunswick World Tournament of Champions. Hi, everyone. I'm Phil Ferguson. Glad to have you by for the next 90 minutes or so, along with my broadcast partner, Marshall Holman. Marshall, 22 titles, won the TFC twice. What does it mean for a player to win this event? Well, it's the most exciting tournament, the most prestigious tournament. It's the one everybody's gunning for, so it, it's simply the best. <laughs> All right, let's take a look now at our outstanding championship final field of eight. In our three-player shootout in the beginning, it'll be Dave Husted, Doug Kent, familiar position, and Tommy DeLutz, Jr. And if there has to be a, a, an underdog, it's going to come out of this first match. Very difficult to, to come from last all the way to four matches in the Tournament of Champions. Now, I know last week Doug Kent did that in Indianapolis, but this is a different tournament, a lot of pressure. It'll be tough. And the winner of that opening match will take on a couple of veterans. Steve Jarris, also, well, why not? Walter Ray Williams, Jr. Yeah, and what has Walter done so far this uh, fall? Well, he's made every telecast, five consecutive with a couple of wins. He's certainly thrown his hat in the running for Player of the Year, and Walter, he can taste it. Talking about Player of the Year, the next match will feature Ryan Schaefer and Norm Duke. Yeah, and for, and for Schaefer and Duke, Schaefer's won two tournaments this year. He's also made ten telecasts, more than anybody else. And for Norm Duke, he is the one who has three titles. He's in the leadership position for Player of the Year. If he locks it up this week with a win. And the player on top, the lone lefty in the field, Jason Couch. And for Couch... He was able to do something, Phil, that the other players certainly couldn't do on the left-hand side of the lane earlier in the week. He figured out the lanes right from the get-go. He beat the next best left-hander by a number of pins. He finds himself in a position this week to make a little bit of history. Nobody has ever won back-to-back -back Tournament of Champions. Jason Couch, he's trying right now. Back to you, Phil. All right, thanks a lot, Marshall. So we're set now for the opening match. Deleuze, Houston. And Kent, among our final field of eight, 82 titles, 11 majors, among this uh, stellar field in the first shot. Tommy Dilutes, Jr., 34 years of age, out of Flushing, New York. Now, well, leaves the one, two, four, and ten, and don't expect to see the ball hooking back like you normally do on the Pro Bowlers Tour. These lanes are very tight down the lane, not a lot of back end. Doug Kent got very comfortable very early last week. David Husted, we have not seen David in a while, although he won earlier this year. Yeah, David's just a part-time player out here on the, on the bowling tour now. Spends most of his time back home in Milwaukee, Oregon with his uh, wife, Michelle, and Corey and Chelsea, his two children. Husted with 14 national titles, four majors, and 20 regional championships. So he bowls a lot of uh, regionals. Now, yeah, Husted comes in high. Deluxe came in light. Needs to get the ball to the left of the one pin. Pocket into the 10. Too much of the head pin. It'll be eight out for Deluxe in the first frame. And Lane's much tougher this week. Scores should be lower. This major tournament, uh, you want the demanding lane conditions, don't you? Now, or what are they going to Well, do? there's no doubt about it, Philly. The, 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 tougher, the tougher the lane conditions, the more shot right making now. comes out. Houston talking about the lanes being on, whether they're on first or second cycle. When they practice, they just throw seven. strike shots. So we're having a little bit of trouble with the pin setters in, the, in resetting right now. Deluxe still has the four and the ten standing, and uh, those pins should have been swept off. Husted waiting to see if the lanes will be swept off. Pins on lane 21. The veteran righty. Six up, fair, no problem. 
problem. Now we take a look at uh, Doug Kent in that seventh spot once again. Well, he took it all the way from the first match last week, but boy, it'll be a demanding task. Lane 21 finally being reset. A little bit of trouble with the machine. It should have it squared away. Well, for Doug Kent, he told me his mental game really has been, uh, right now, the best of uh, his career. Last week won four matches to win in Indianapolis. First shot. And it looked like last week a little bit, Marshall. It does look just like last week. Certainly Kent found the mark in the first frame. And the result, 10 in the pitch. Luke, able to kick out the 10 pin. So after that open, he comes back with a strike. Don't look for anybody to run away and hide in this tournament. The scores are going to be competitive. They're going to be probably, well, if you could shoot 220, I would think that would be more than enough to win. And here's Ted with a strike in the second frame. High back swing for Dave Husted and very solid at the line. Good long reach. Oh, Ken once again back at it. Well, Doug Kent did nothing but strike last week and he hasn't stopped. Dilutes in the third frame, just one PBA title, 10 regional championships. The four and the nine. Not only tough to get to the pocket, Phil, but the carry was difficult all week. Houston, I think if you look back 10, 15 years ago, same style. Long back swing and like you had mentioned, solid at the line. Beautiful. And a little bit high, leaving the four pin for Houston. Dulutz will have to go for this. Try to get the ball left of the four pin, slide it into the nine. And he got too much fourth in. It'll so be an open. Deloots with an open in the first, also the third frame. Strike in the second, struggling early on. And almost a middle error from Houston as he hangs on. Picked up the fourth pin, but uh, puts a little excitement into single pin spare shooting. Well, again, Doug Kent off the, with a double. Have to be so precise to put the ball in the pocket. And, and the 4-9 for Doug Kent. We saw a lot of it during the qualifying and match play, and the reason being that if you throw the ball to the right, it won't hook back, so you're trying to lodge the ball into the pocket. A lot of high pocket splits. Well, there's the ball going out to the right and not coming back, so... Two shots that Duluth really threw pretty well. One just a tad high for the 4-9. One a bit light. It's a 210. We've seen a lot of matches. One with the 210 and 220 this week. Ken. He opens the door really for Dave Husted and uh, Tommy Duluth. Uh, Husted takes the lead sitting on the bench. Duluth chops it off, so three opens on a four frames right now. Dave Husted, the early leader. Dan Marshall, wire away. Husted. Got a spare, and Doug Kent uh, strike in the fourth frame. Tommy Duluth continues to struggle. Had yeah, Duluth spared in the fifth, and Husted struck in the fifth frame. Now Doug Kent working on a strike. Can take the lead back with the strike here in the fifth. Trailing by three. Well, you talked about it. You sent it out a little bit wide, and it's just not coming back. Well, it, it almost, you can almost count on it. They, he went high the last time on lane 21, leaving the 4-9, and then he comes in light for 1-2-10. The Lutes looking for the pocket. 
And it's not too late. If Duluth can get something going, the scores are low enough that he can come back in this match. Kent played it the right way. Well, wrapped the head pin around the 10. Just the way you have to try and make it. Didn't get the fortunate kick. And Houston with the only clean game so far. Spare strike, a couple of spares, and a strike. He has the lead. 15 pin lead right now for Houston over Kent. Working on a strike could make it 25. Houston ninth on the all time list, career earnings. Million five. And Houston the a five pin. Fortunate. Didn't leave the seven with it. Then. Marsha, you take a look uh, at the prize money this week. Well, this will get the attention of all the players. $60,000 up top, and uh, boy, it's just great all the way down. And in the sixth. Will the 10 fall? It doesn't. Houston has been uh, right around the pocket, and that may be the key tonight. Bunching a lot of strikes together. Very tough, so you got to pick up the spares. Doug Kent does it. Dave Houston on top by 15. Here. Well, knowing you, Marshall, you'll probably be up at 3 a.m. watching it. Maybe I just won't go to sleep. <laughs> right now, it's Dave Houston. Hanging tough, but you had mentioned Tommy Duluth. He got a strike in the sixth. On the cut into that lead. Oh, yeah. Low scores. Tommy Duluth gets a double. He can still get there. Watch as he just opens up the rack. Everything sort of just spreads around. And he loves that one. Says, I still got a chance. Duluth's down by just 24. Houston inducted into the PBA Hall of Fame a few years ago, 1996. Oh, Sets it right in a beautiful shot from Houston. And you mentioned earlier that Houston puts the ball in play more than any other player. Very straight trajectory. Watch the ball. It's actually falling back toward the pocket. Solid. Tonight, you keep it in play, pick up your spares. You have a good shot at winning. Kent. Right there. Well, that's the way Doug Kent started out the first match with solid strikes in the first and second frame. Had a couple of open frames in the third and fifth. Just 15 down, and Duluth's just 24 down. Could make it 14 with a strike in the eighth. Never say die. Boy, he's loosened up a little bit. Boy, he got off to a terrible start. He had open frames the first, first three out of four frames. But he's come back strong. Eighth frame and down on one knee for the veteran. Now for Kent. Working on a strike. Practices a lot, 75 to 100 games a week. Not on the floor. And all the players figuring out the lanes late in the game. Everybody struck in the seventh and eighth frame. Duluth's max score right now is 215. He'll need this strike here in the ninth. Got to hurry. Lost the ball right off his hand. And absolutely no chance to look back. You can see the ball going to the right. It's not when it gets that far to the right on this condition, it will not hook back. I don't care what kind of fingers you put in the ball. Houston up in the ninth, working on a double. He leads by 15 over Kent. He's starting to run him out a little, a little early, maybe, Marshall. Uh, more Houston, games to go. Houston knows the importance of that strike in the ninth. He'll need just a mark in the tenth to lock it up. Duluth. Nice spare in the ninth, but uh, trouble for Tommy Duluth. That may cost him a chance at winning this opening match. It looks like it's between Houston and Kent. 
Now Kent can still shoot 224. He strikes the ninth and out in the tenth. And that would force you said to, to excuse me to strike in the tenth frame. Kent won last week in Indianapolis. There's another one. And it's between Kent and Houston right now. Tommy Duluth will finish first, 191, the best he can shoot. Boy, Duluth's a good, uh, good young player. Bold nearly 500 games on tour this year, averaging just about 215. Look at that follow through, but high on the head pin. And tough to keep concentration at this point in the game. He knows he has no chance to win. Just trying to get out of the way. Now for Husted, in the 10th frame, he needs a strike, a six count and spare. And that would take the first match. Biggest shot of the week. It won't get there. Looks like it stuck a little bit on his thumb. Now something seemed to something disturbed David on that shot. Luke makes his spare. Take a look at Houston. High backswing. Well, he didn't like it immediately. He knew that ball was going to the right. As I said earlier, it just will not hook back. Now, these are relatively easy spare. The one, the two, and the eight. And he does not make it. Well, the first open for Houston in the tenth. Ball looks like it has a chance to make it here, but watch the ball. The pins will deflect off each other. The ball doesn't hook into the eight pin, and it's an open frame for Houston. He shoots 204. Kent will need the first strike in the tenth, and then any kind of count, and he'll win. Kent, a little bit extra time. Houston, 204. Nine spare strike would give Kent 203. Houston has 204, so he needs the strike working on three strikes in a row. And there it is. So tall under pressure it comes through. Another win for Doug Kent for last week. Five in a row for Doug Kent. Able to concentrate, make the shot flush in the pocket. The reaction from Kent, desperately loving it. Five matches in a row, going back to the four he won last week, Phil. Boy, and it's tough to win on TV, let alone win five matches, especially in this type of format. Well, you? yeah, when, especially when you have to beat two people every game. Very difficult. Dejected uh, David Husted looks on, and Kent will wrap up this match. Another beautiful shot, playing that tight line. So Doug Kent finishing with a flurry. Kent making the big finish. It looked as if something might have disturbed Husted as he was releasing the shot, but Kent made the, the great shots when he needed in the 10th frame, and he'll advance to the next match. Kent trips the four forward. Why not? Six straight strikes and a 2-24. Doug Kent moves on now for our next match, taking on Walter Ray Williams Jr. and Steve Jarris. And welcome back. This is the Brunswick World Tournament of Champions. And the winner in our opening match with a 2-24, Doug Kent. But look at that, nine strikes in that opening match, two opens. Got to keep away from those uh, open frames if he hopes to uh, move on. Dave Houston with a 204 Tommy Deluce 179. Let me send it on down to my partner now, Marshall Holman. Marsh? Uh, thank you very much, Bill. I'm here with Jason Couch. And Jason, going for history, nobody's ever won this tournament back-to-back. -back. What's your plan of attack? Well, I uh, coming in tonight thinking uh, 10 clean flames are going to do it tonight. I mean, 10 clean frames all week have been pretty good. Uh, scores are very low, Marshall. Uh, it, it's just, it'd be an honor to enter the history book this tonight. So, uh, I've got one under my belt from last year. I'm just looking to go out there and, uh, tear him up for 10 frames. Okay, no, no. What did you find on the left side that the other lefties just didn't seem to see for this week? Seems like I've got a 
a little bit more of a comfort zone the farther in I play on the lane, which is very unusual for a left-hander, but uh, I seem to get more comfortable the farther in I play with a little more angle, and uh, I played between the fourth and sixth arrow at some point during the week, really never played left of there, so uh, it's really my comfort zone. All right, well, you're comfortable. You're the leader. <laughs> Good luck tonight. Thanks. All right, Phil, back up to you. All right, thanks a lot, Marshall. Speaking of comfort zone, right now, Doug Kent over the past uh, really, week, he won four matches last week to win in Indianapolis. Prior to 224 to win match one here in the Tournament of Champions. But uh, Walter Ray Williams Jr. and Steve Jaros may have something to say about Kent moving on. First shot, second match. Walter Ray right in the pocket. Old Deadeye. Starts it off with a strike. For Kent, his fourth TV appearance. He is uh, cashed in 13 tournaments this year. He gets a strike. So he really has had a consistent year. And a lot of players talk about Doug Kent. They, they put, associate the word consistency with Doug Kent. Well, he's just the kind of player that knows how to combat all the conditions. And the two most comfortable players on tour today, we're looking at him, Doug Kent and Walter Ray Williams Jr. Seems like they're on television week in and week out. Gerald. And a strike for Jarrett. The only bowler that seems to be able to get the ball to hook back into the pocket is Steve Jarrett. And you've got to be careful of the speed of playing that line. Walter Ray in the second frame. All strikes so far. Now through the nose for Williams. Leaves the 6-10. Fortunately breaking up the split. Just won 300 game this week. That by lefty Joe Salvemini. The next high game, Mike Miller with a 290 demanding lane conditions. And that one turned pretty quick at the end. 6-10 through the nose. Same shot that Williams just threw. Dead I should have no problem with the spare. He picks it up. We'll see Kent's ball rolling down the lane, hooking onto the nose, breaking down the split, leaving the 6'10 as he shoots for the 6'10. He makes it. A couple of spares. Well, we want Kent and for Walter Ray. We watched Jarris last year toss a 300 game on television in Chattanooga. Very exciting. I, I, if he shoots 300 here, I think, I think I'll, I'll take a little money out of your pocket. To get He's from Bolingbrook, Illinois, just about uh, 40 miles south of here. He comes in high. Hey, very interesting. In the second frame, everybody comes in high. Everybody breaks down the split. Everybody leaves a 6-10. And uh, Walter's kind of chuckling over that. I think he finds that somewhat humorous. A man who loves statistics. <laughs> All-time leader there. 121 TV appearances. Earl Anthony is uh, second with 113. And Walter strikes. I think Marshall Hall, I think you're up in TV appearance. Well, you're on every week with me. So does that count? It does as far as I'm concerned. Sure. <laughs> Well, I know you approach about 100 television appearances over your illustrious career. And again, you have won this tournament twice, and it means so much uh, to a player. Jason, we talked to him last night. He said after he won last year, doors open. Well, I've never seen Jason so emotional as he was last night when he took that number one seed for today's telecast. It does mean a lot for the players. Kent, one last week in Indy. Third frame. Three, six, nine, ten. Now let's take a look in the bag at what Steve Jarris is using. He's got the Brunswick contact zone. The pin is four and a quarter from its axis. Got an extra hole three inches from the axis below the midline. Makes the ball roll more in the middle of the lane. Not snap too hard in the back. And uh, it worked that time. The spare ball the target zone. He doesn't want to even lose that, use that ball at all. <laughs> Had to get out the spare ball this week. Kent trying to pick up really a, a difficult spare, Marshall. They have to fit the ball between the three and the six and drive through to get the nine. Got too much of the three pin. It's eight out. He said he'd rather shoot a split. I don't blame him. That's a very difficult, difficult spare to try and make. All right now, Williams, Walter Ray, and Steve Jarris tied. Kent 16 pins down. 
Williams and Jarris could make that 26 for the strike in the fourth frame. This gentleman here, 32 titles, 32 second place finishes. The man's a bowling machine. He absolutely loves it, and that's probably the key to his longevity is he just keeps, he keeps bowling because he loves it. Ball hits about the 21 board at the arrows. Back into the pocket. Now watch the 10 pin. Just nudged out by the six. Kent, after the open in the third, needs a strike to keep up with Williams. Coming in light, leaving the seven pin. The difference between this pin action and what we normally see on the Pro Bowlers Tour is the ball did not drive back to the left, so it's fading away. That takes the power out of the shot, makes it difficult to knock them all down. Jarris with a strike. Share the lead. Jarris and Williams, they're tied. I mentioned at the top of the show how difficult it would be to come from the first match all the way through. Not only are they great players here in the Tournament of Champions, but the, the condition is just so difficult, demanding. You must be precise with your speed and your roll. When I asked Walter about goals, he said, uh, well, Earl was six times uh, voted player of the year. And Walter gets a strike, and Walter Ray five times. And, and really, he's made five shows on the fall, five telecasts. He's had five tournaments. He has an outside shot, but if he wins today, well, he, I, I think Walter really, he would need to win today. And uh, Duke and Schaefer still, they have the power. They're in control. Four pin doesn't trip out for Doug Kent. Kent will have to get it going soon or he won't be going on to that third match. Jarris using a little less speed, making his ball tip in the back end. More power. This is Jarris' ball hooking back into the pocket, driving the five pin into the seven, and the reaction from a man who's locked in right now. Morgan, what do I know of <laughs> Ohio State? Something on the approach that during the break, uh, Walter Ray was <laughs> cleaning something. I can see once he wants applause for striking, he wants applause for cleaning up the lanes. Okay, Walter, you're great. We admit it. <laughs> well, and he's fortunate. Just the six pin. And that looked like lack of speed, Phil. Direction looked good on the lane, but if you don't put the proper speed on the ball, it'll hook early, go right to the nose. Doug Kent working on a spare. He trails by 37. In the sixth, he's got to start striking. Solid 10, made the good shot, didn't carry. Now Walter switching balls once again to a plastic ball. It has very little friction, hard and straight. Now Walter has won just about everything, Marshall, but he has not won the Tournament of Champions. Yeah, give him time. Jarris in the driver's seat. There's a shot of Steve's lovely wife, June. Mother of twins, a boy and a girl. Evan and Hannah born last year, and he really a handful, and Steve didn't bowl a lot last year. That'll take up a lot of your time. I can only imagine. You're right, Marshall. Uh, a little bit softer speed, but he's able to throw it out a little bit and work it in. Yeah, and he takes the lead, and uh, I think that's an approval from June. Yes! She loves it. She's got more emotion than, uh, <laughs> than Steve does. Shows more. Seventh frame. And that hooks high and three times to the well. And there's Paige. It's probably Paige doesn't want the camera on her right now. Not for that shot. I don't, I don't blame her. That did not break the pins down. He leaves the four, the six, and the seven. How much is celebrated about that one? Oh, 
now. A strike in the seventh for Kent. But right now, Jarrett's after a strike spare. He's ripped off four in a row. And Walter Ray with the open in the seventh. Jarris uh, pretty much sitting down and has a comfortable lead. And Jarris is the man that came from further back than anybody to make the top eight. He was over 200 pins behind eighth place with 13 games to go in match play. Mm -hmm. So uh, really quite quite a strong run to finish. Yeah, shot 264, 277. Really made up a lot of ground and he gets another one. Jarris taking command here in the second match. Brunswick World Tournament of Champions. Slower ball speed allows the ball a chance to hook back into the pocket. More power. And Jarris with a fairly comfortable lead over Williams Jr. and Doug Kent sort of finishing out the string. with a 235 maximum right now Jarris if he were to nine spare and spare strike out he'd be shooting 239 so for Jarris just keeping the count filling the frames it'll be enough easier said than done this week much now Kent's back in the pocket well we're we talking about Jarris maybe uh, slowing up the speed a little bit Kent play the rocket to the pocket and he has a double, maybe a little too uh, a little too late as Jarris with that max score of 280 should he strike out from this the eighth frame on. And I said 220 would probably win. <laughs> Jarris will be well above 220. That gives him a 35 pin lead over Williams. Chance. Ball coming in high. There goes the four pin. Nine falls. He certainly could use this a few frames ago, but he knows he still has an outside chance. And for Kent now, three in a row. He's ball through nine. Jarris, um, well, he's on the show today, Marshall, but he fired a 129, the lowest score ever bowled on TV right here back in 1992. I'm sure that's out of his mind at the present time. You can, you can, uh, he's not thinking about that now. He is thinking about a lot of strikes, seven strikes in a row for Steve Jarrett. He's going to shoot a lot more than he'll, he'll double it plus. Well, Jarrett's high game of the whole week, 278. 48 games. Will it fall? The seven pin will not. And quality shot for Williams, but it'll be Steve Jarris. Everything going towards the seven pin. Wiggling. He's trying. He's trying <laughs> to make it fall. He's blowing on his thumb, as if to say he got a lot of thumb on the ball and not too much fingers. Doug Kent finishing strong, but seven a row for Steve Jarris is too late. But Walter, always next week, and he'll probably make the show again in Austin. Five for five on the fall tour. Put nothing past him. Kent really finishing strong. He had an open in that third frame, and three spares, and now four strikes. Well, the winning will end for Doug Kent. Four last week. He won the first match today. It'll be a fifth place finish. William shoots 214. Doug Kent can fire 222 at the strike, and it's 221. But Doug Kent, after five straight wins on the Pro Bowlers Tour here on ESPN, he will not make it into the semifinal match. This gentleman will, Steve Jarris.
strikes bear and now seven in a row in the tenth frame. And he throws an air ball. Maybe he was maybe he was trying to see if he could if he could get a little more hook, trying to go for a little bit of area check for Jarrett. But Jarrett, he's your winner, and he's going to advance to the next match. And welcome back. It is the prestigious Brunswick World Tournament of Champions. Second match. Steve Jarris, a lot of strikes. Clean game, 257. Doug Cam with a 221. Walter Ray Williams Jr. with a 214. Coming up on the Pro Bowlers Tour to finish out this fall swing, a little Texas two-step for you next week. A special Wednesday night telecast. Always great to go back to Highland Lanes in Austin. That's a 7 o'clock Eastern time start. And the PBA concludes its 2000 season with a Saturday afternoon telecast. The inaugural Lone Star Open Saturday, November 25th. Now it's time for our score more with Brunswick Tip. And Marshall, something a little bit different this week as we take a look. The spotlight on youth bowling. Great opportunity for the young uh, boys and girls out there nowadays. Well, it certainly is, Phil. And the, the kids bowled great. 1,100 started out. 200 made the finals in Akron, Ohio. And then four, the top four bowled here. Two were eliminated yesterday, and then our top two. First place, $25,000 scholarship. Second place, 12-5. So winners all around. That's right, and those two battled it out. Eric Vermilia and Chris Jones. Let's take a look at the action. And it's the best two out of three game final this afternoon. And Chris Jones for the win in the first match. It's high flush. He takes game one. And then Eric Vermilia. he's looking to square things up one match apiece. Ball's coming in a little high, but he gets the friendly oh, yeah. roll, wins game two. And then in the third match for the win, Chris Jones from Indiana University, the freshman, taking care of business, $25,000 first place, $12,500 for Eric Vermilia. Yeah, great afternoon of youth bowling. Yeah, congratulations to all the young bowlers. For information about next year's Youth Masters, call 1-888-269-5278 or check out the website at uh, youthmasters.com, youthmasters.com or killerbpromo.com. Coming up, our semifinal match, Steve Jarris going up against Norm Duke and Ryan Schaefer. And we are ready now for the semifinal match. Should be a dandy. <laughs> all right. Boy, great crowds all week long here in the uh, Chicago area. Duke and Schaefer and Jarris. That's not boo, boo, boo you're hearing. That's Duke, Duke. Small in stature, but uh, yeah. large when it comes to his bowling ability. The mighty one. Youngest player ever to win a PBA title at the age of 18. He won in Cleveland. It's been a great career. Getting it back, not quite enough. And leaves the two and the five, and so far the only player who can consistently get the ball to hook back into the pocket is Jarris. Shaver. I don't know, Myra, New York. Power player. A couple of uh, national titles, both this year. Six regional championships, opening shot. He got it back. Schaefer has been able to figure out the lanes all year long. Tenth telecast for Ryan. Harden straight. No problems for Duke. Great spare shooter. Pretty good strike shooter as well. Jarris after uh, winning with the 257. Been really three solid games on this uh, condition. Beautiful style. That's the result. Boy, right, looks so comfortable on lanes right now. Steve Jarris, 257 last game. He improved from his previous high game on the television pair at the Deer Park Lane. That was uh, 129, so he was 128 pins better that game. All right. Duke, the 94 Tournament of Champions winner. 
playing what we call the fallback shot, just trying to get the ball left off his hand and just have it slide into the pocket. Well, it slid a little too much. Wasn't able to knock out the five pin. He tries to use the body English, but uh, not to be done. Schaefer, second frame. He opened with a strike. Well, he's got the ball hooking back into the pocket, but he leaves a solid 10. You talk about uh, spares, and here's one of the top spare shooters on tour on Duke. And you would mentioned before in previous shows, Marshall, Brian Schaefer early on had some problems with single pin spares, especially the 10 pin, but he's come a long way. Well, every facet of his game has improved, and spare shooting suit certainly one of them. Tied with Barnes for the most telecast, 10. No problem making the 10 pin. Certainly disappointed leaving that solid 10, but not only was it difficult to get to the pocket, but boy, knocking them all down was a real trick all week. Jarris has had a nice year. 11 caches, 15 tournaments so far. Up in the second. Ball came in half pocket. Six pin not able to kick out of the channel and knock the 10 out. A little bit lighter in the pocket that might have struck. A little heavier, minus drugs. So we've got it in the half pocket trap zone. You saw the sixth in try and jump out, but not to be. Jarris. That's the line. A little bit like uh, Don Johnson with the right arm flailing to the right. Picks up that 10 pin spare. Going back a few years, Don Johnson, a former champion of the mm -hmm. Tournament of Champions. Beat Dick Ricker in a 299 to 268. Back. Ball just sliding all the way down, leaving the two, four, five. Let's take a look at the way Duke sort of pops up at the line. Doesn't stay down, lifts up. Unfortunately, he got some lift in his body, but didn't get enough lift out of those fingers. Schaefer strike spare. Well, that hooked back. Oh my gosh, didn't think it would. He didn't think it would either, I don't think, Marshall. Duke, he picked up the 2-4-5. Schaefer a little bit similar. Watch the form of Ryan Schaefer. He lifts up the line, too. Both smaller men. I don't think it has anything to do with, uh, with the size. I just think it's, it's just part of what gets them to the line the same way every time. Jarris' third TV appearance this year. Two appearances last year. And a 10 pin. Solid 10. Right in the pocket. All right, this match, like Come on. very close right now. Jarris one down to Schaefer. Duke four down to Schaefer. Duke putting a piece of tape in the ball. Duke's kind of a fiddler. He always, he's always working to get the exact feel of the ball. Take a look at our scores. Ryan Schaefer right now with that one pin lead over Jarris, four over Duke. Early in our third match. Duke with 19 national titles, four regional titles, player of the year, 94. One five times that year. Boy, that ball really slid a long way. In fact, it looked as though it may have hit the fingers with some hole about 45, 50 feet down the lane because it looked as if it actually bounced. Look at his release, very straight up the back of the ball, not trying to do a lot to the, to the fingers, just trying to lodge it into the pocket, and he hit the pocket, but just got nine. Schaefer looking for a double. Oh, right. There's some power from Ryan Schaefer, hitting light in the pocket, throwing the five pin into the seven. Similar to uh, when Schaefer bowled and won his first tournament at the Orleans in Vegas earlier this year, playing that same trajectory from inside, hooking the ball back into the pocket, even though there weren't a lot of back ends. Jarris with a high finish, second in the Brunswick Pro Source Don Carter Classic in Dallas. And oh, wow! Well, and you know well, you, you don't see a lot of that. They get the five out. <laughs> He got the five out of the A-10, but, uh, well, 
you wouldn't think they'd leave. There's Carmen Salvino, the great Carmen Salvino, one of my heroes, and uh, certainly a hero of today, Parker Bone the Third. Two great Hall of Famers sitting next to each other, and Parker was inducted into the Hall of Fame just earlier this week. So Duke coming back, uh, really a great week for Parker Bone, once again in the Hall of Fame, along with Chicago Tribune sports writer, the late Jim Fitzgerald, a great night here in Chicago, 79 in the PBA Hall of Fame. And boy, Jarris, that is tough. Yeah, but getting back to Jarris' 8-10, I saw a lot of them in the match play portion of the tournament, and I saw some 5-8-10 left by Norm Duke, left by David Husted. I mean, it had more to do with the way the lanes were conditioned than it did with the kind of ball that the Bulls were actually throwing. In the fifth. Boy, Schaefer making them look easy. I thought that Jarris was getting the ball to tip back to the pocket nicely, but Schaefer, he's driving that ball back into the 1-3. Jarris after that open in the fourth. And in the pocket of 10-pin Marshall, he left a 10-pin, and then the 8-10, the 10-pin. And how quickly you go from a position of, of being the dominant player, as Jarris was in the last match, to struggling. And still hitting the pocket, but the carry is gone now. He'll switch balls, throw the ball straight, make this 10-pin, and try and regroup himself for later in the game. Jarris. No problem with that spare, and right now it is Schaefer. Three in a row, and he's on top. And welcome back on National Hockey Night, the Battle of the Keystone State. Rematch of a uh, quintuple overtime playoff game from last spring ESPN. Wednesday night at 7, the Flyers and the Penguins. Oh, Yarmer, Yager. Then Brandon Shanahan and Sergei Fedorov of the Red Wings visit Keith Kachuk and Jeremy Runnick of the Phoenix Coyotes. That is on the deuce, and it will be tomorrow night at 10 o'clock, National Hockey Night. Well, yeah, Norm spent a lot of time uh, putting that together. Yeah, he was up late last night. You want to get it just right. <laughs> They're not going to win the basketball championship this year. Yeah, they Maybe may. fifth. All right. Schaefer right now, a comfortable lead, Marshall. 34 in front of Jarris, 25 in, in front of Duke. Duke working on a strike. Cut into that lead. But it's not going to happen. He is not in command of the pocket. Still searching. And this man right here, Ryan Schaefer, he is. Certainly a, a chance. Duke with three titles, Schaefer with two. But if his third title is the Tournament of Champions, plus a $60,000 prize, for first place, could be Schaefer's year. And brings it back again, and it's another strike. And boy, I saw the 810 kind of kick out of there late, Marshall. You talked about 60,000 first prize, plus a five-year exemption into this tournament. Very important. Duke will make the spare, but it's going to take more than just spares from Norm Duke. As Schaefer has four strikes in a row, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth frames. Out here. in the sixth. He has thrown a lot of good shots. Scored with no indication of how well he's bold here. Well, not this one. He's oh. gotten more speed. Gosh. He's picked up the ball speed. Yeah, the ball is sliding down the lane. It's not picking back into the pocket. It just keeps going right. Six pin around the bottom of the 10 and frustration for Jarris. Yeah. Better shot for Duke on lane 21, but he better be able to put a few together if he wants to, care, wants to catch Schaefer. Jarris picks it up. Right now it's Ryan Schaefer in the lead in command of this semifinal match. He's 35 pins up right now on, on Duke and 45 on, on uh, Jarrett. The winner will take on Jason Couch for the championship. And for five in a row. Oh, solid eight. Oh, perfect. 
terrific shot. All he can do is put his hands behind his, behind his neck and go, why me? That's the ball rolling right dead flush into the pocket. The reaction from Schaefer, he cannot believe it. Well, that's the knockout strike. Should he get a seven? One time. Better. Must keep his concentration. Make the spare. Still in command. So no problem with the eight pin. But he expected that last one to be a strike, not a spare. Take a look at our scoreboard. You can see Schaefer with the commanding lead over both Jarris and Duke. 44 pins over Jarris, 35 over Duke. Duke with a strike. To that lead. And finally, finally he gets a strike on the right-hand lane. And I want to tell you, he was fortunate. Those pins reluctantly fell. Watch the ball as it continues to fall back to the right, and the five pin just barely gets <laughs> nudged out. A little jumping from Duke. He loves it. Still got a chance. We still got a chance. Schaefer in the eighth. <laughs> Carry now gone for Schaefer and could have turned on that one solid eight. That stopped the string of Schaefer, and then Duke got up and he answered with a strike of his own in the eighth frame. Cuts that lead down. Jarris can uh, make it a double here in the eighth. So 225 max for Jarris. Come on. Oh. That was a lot better. <laughs> he liked the shot. Jarris with a 205 max. Schaefer with a 2.48 max. He makes the spare. Now Jarris trying to convert the 10 bid. Does. Now Norm Duke with a double marshal up in the ninth. Well, another must shot for Duke. And he struck the last time, last couple of times on lane 21. So he's more comfortable on this lane than the other. Can knock it down to a 13 pin deficit for Duke. See his maximum score of 235. Put the pressure right on. Shit. Oh. Everything but the 10. And he knows he couldn't have thrown it any better. Watch the 6 10 second from the right, around the bottom of the 10. And a heartbreak for Norm Duke. Schaefer needing marks. Ninth frame. Any kind of spare in this frame. And uh, the 10 pin. Leaves the 10. That's all right. Pick up the 10 pin. Still puts himself in excellent position. Marshall, we're used to watching the players uh, holding from the right to the right-handers and really seeing the ball drive into the pocket. A little bit different this week. Well, the oil's a little further down the lane this week. It was, uh, was buffed down to 49 feet and just not a lot of back end. So they were players were forced to play deep inside and create their own hook. Schaefer just barely hangs on and makes the 10 pin. Jarris with a 205, best he can shoot. Schaefer just needs to stay behind the line to take care of Jarris. Norm Duke can shoot 214. <laughs> well, Schaefer with nine count on the first ball. And they give him 215. And the best Duke can do is 214. So if Duke does strike out, Schaefer needs just nine. And another solid 10. And now Schaefer needs just to stay behind the line. He should advance, but... We'll watch his shot in the 10th frame. I'd like to start striking again, get ready for that match against Jason Couch for the title. And all brings it in the pocket. So your winner, Ryan Schaefer. 
And Schaefer with a clean game will take on our tournament leader, Jason Couch, trying to make it back-to-back TSC -back wins. Well, we're ready now for the uh, championship uh, match. Coming your way in just a few minutes, it is Ryan Schaefer, and he'll go up against Jason Couch. A beautiful trophy awaits the winner as we take a look at the tournament recap. No players won two in a row. It was Doug Ken in match one with that 224. Steve Jarris, easy time of it in match two, and then uh, Ryan Schaefer, 226. Beats Norm Duke and Steve Jarris to move on. Uh, take a look at some of the other finishers. Dennis Horan had won 19 games in match play and just barely, barely didn't make it. And there's the amateur, Bill Hoffman. Strong ball. You'll see him out on tour the next few years. Chris Barnes finishing 13th. Didn't get it going till late in the proceedings. Just ran out of time. Great year. There's Robert Smith. The U.S. Open champion finishing 18th. I saw him leave a couple of 8-10s, and he throws the ball about as strong as anybody I've ever seen. And Steve Wilson from Lake Worth, Florida. Started out pretty hot in the tournament, and then towards the end, just not able to keep up with the pace. Now we are ready. And it'll be Ryan Schaefer, Jason Couch, and uh, Schaefer trying to win this event in his first year of eligibility. Only five other players have accomplished the beat, including uh, Marshall Holman. Well, and I think he's going to do it. Wow. Now, nobody's, nobody's won two matches in a row. I watch Couch in practice, and he, nobody really looked like they had a great command of the lanes, but right now, Schaefer looks very comfortable. Of course, you know, Jarris looked good after his first match, too, but I think Schaefer can keep it going. And give give uh, Couch all he can handle. Right back swing and a strike to start the championship match. Confident start, very confident start for Jason Couch. Playing the inside line, says he's comfortable in there, unlike most lefties who don't play that often. Nice start for Couch. With a strike in the first. Gaining confidence with every shot. And it looks as if Schaefer is moving deeper to the left with almost every shot as well. The lane oil drying up at the front part of the lane and staying very much tight or oily in the back of the lane. You can see Schaefer defeated Duke and Jarris in our last match. And for Duke, he knew that if he could win this tournament, it would lock up player of the year, something he wants so desperately. He'll have to earn it in the next few weeks. Could be tough catching this man right here. And uh, it the four, but well, he, he got a piece of that four pin, but not enough to knock down the Brunswick Pro pins. Three pounds, 10 ounces. Ball hitting the 27 board at the Arrows. Coming in a bit high and four pin wiggles, but does not fall over. Schaefer will. Take his time and pick up this four pin. Well, he's had a great year, second on tour, average at nearly 220. His 10th TV appearance this year. And uh, picks up the spare. Strike spare to start for Schaefer, and now it's Jason Couch after that opening strike. Couch has bowled a bunch of games this year, 535 with an average of uh, 217. Last year, good year, 223,000 plus. A strong lefty from Claremont, Florida. Boy, has that high backswing. Former rookie of the year. And oh, solid 10. Oh, my. A little sarcastic applause. Watch, watch the 10 pin. Pins fly all over the place. That was flush in the pocket. He can't believe it. He knows it's a strike right now. But no, not here. Not this tournament. Oh, my. Have to regroup after throwing a perfect shot. Well, you're exactly right. He needs to put it behind him. 
concentrate on making the spare and get on with his work. Well, the PBA's player of the race hitting the home stretch, and you can get all the latest info on how the top players are doing. PBA's new website, pba.com. Website is the best source for all the latest news from the PBA National, also the senior regional tours, also features a chat room with a variety of subject matters, all that and more, pba.com, where they have some interesting stories. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Walter Ray Williams Jr., and then last week, Chris Barnes. you got to check it out, pba.com. Well, that's how I keep tabs on what's happening in the early stages of the tournament. Take a look at the results from the first day before I fly on back. Set a bunch of records, five. The strike, spare and strike. But Couch thinks it should have been three in a row. From the left-handed perspective of the lane, we'll watch the pins as it hits light. Ball in the one-two pocket. There's the five, the six, and the ten, and uh, now there's nothing. Hmm. There could have been 15 pins up there and got them all down on that shot. Brian in the third frame. Strike ties up the match. Each player spare. Each player was a strike, a spare, and a strike in our first three frames. I'm asking for a re-rack. He's re-racking the pin. Probably didn't like the way the one and the three pin were standing. That's where the right-handers look at the one-three pocket. Left-handers look at the one-two. Could be a little bit wide or could be a little bit narrow and. It makes a difference, both in the uh, in the pin carry and the confidence factor of getting up and making the shot. Well, he's making the most out of his first appearance. Brunswick World Tournament of Champions. This match dead even, fourth frame. For the lead, and it's high, and it's a Greek church. The four, six, seven, eight, and ten. Ball's going to cut right through the heart of the pins. Ball hooks so strong in the back end. Lanes continue to break down. He'll throw at the three on the right. Maybe an early birthday present for this man, Jason Couch, his birthday tomorrow. I'd like to celebrate it with a win here at the TSC. Back to back TSC. Victor's for Couch, but still a long way to go. Schaefer an open in the fourth frame and Couch. Well, I'll give it a 14 pin present right there. That's Couch's lead. Well, he threw a clutch strike last night against Norm Duke in the 10th to be the top seed. Yeah, it's the six pin. Little slow, little slow. Couch this year with a second place finish. National championship in Toledo. Third in Chattanooga and fourth in Erie. Well, there's a lot of pressure. The finals of the Tournament of Champions. We keep saying how much prestige placed on this tournament, and we mean it. It's true. Couch picks up the uh, spare in the fourth frame. And uh, Couch, TV record, 14 and 22. However, from the top spot, he is 5 and 4. Each shot so critical. Anytime you're on television, he leads by 14. You know what it's like, Marshall, TFC. Well, I can remember the last couple of shots you know, way back when I made my first telecast in the TSC in, in 76, and it was, it's difficult to, to start your feet and get the ball off your hand. Carry it! Carries that seven pin. He knew the ball was in the pocket. It was just a matter of whether the seven pin was going to respond or not. Now, he knows this ball's in the pocket right now, but will the seven pin fall? Kicked out by the four, and the reaction, you bet. Schaefer in the fifth frame. After an open in the fourth. Ball's coming back. Schaefer with a four pin. He's 
going to have to continue to move further left on the approach. Maybe a little even more projection down the lane. The ball is starting to, to face up early. That's what the pros call it. That's, that means it just starts to hook as soon as it touches the lane. Picks up the spare. Ryan Schaefer. Down by 14. Still a long way to go. When you take a look at the history of this tournament, Marshall, uh, just uh, one three-time winner, that's Mike Durbin. Of course, uh, Dave Davis won it a couple of times, and Marshall Holman a couple of times, and Jason Couch. And he was always my favorite. Marshall Holman? You bet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's been a long time, but I'll tell you, you will, I'll never forget, never forget either one of the wins. Just so special. Almost fouled. It looked like stuck at the line and leaves just the 10 pin. Yeah, didn't get the leverage. Had trouble with the approach. We'll take another look at the approach of Jason Couch. Everything looks good here, but right there, just he just got off balance, stuck a little at the line was falling back instead of having the momentum going towards the pins. Leaves the 10. Schaefer just trying to keep within striking distance because he needs a few strikes to get back in the match. But still a good one here between Ryan Schaefer and Jason Couch. Couch on top, midway through the championship game. Speaking of intense people, Jason Couch certainly uh, intense. He's low key right now, still a half a game to go. And one of these players is going to make history. And both the players are, are slowing their tempo down a little bit with each pressure shot that they throw. To go up by 25. I like it. And a seven pin. Oh, my. Couch trying to win back-to-back -to -back TFC titles. The first player ever to do that. And for Ryan Schaefer. Found the frustration for Couch. Watch the four pin go around the bottom of the seven. We see a lot of ring and tens. Now, same thing. Lefty hand. Lefty leaving the ringing seven pin. And you saw when, when uh, Couch was coming back after the 7th pin, much like when he left that 10, he gave himself a little round of applause. And that's, that just sort of pumped himself up, say, okay, I did my job, threw the best I could, just didn't strike. Hang on. And then picks up the spare. And to finish my thought, Schaefer, should he win, will join the league group of uh, five other players who have won this tournament first year of eligibility. And there's the scoreboard, Marshall. 15 pins for Jason Couch. That's his lead right now, and that is by no means... Any kind of a runaway. Couch has made very, very good shots, leaving the solid 10 pin and the solid 7 pin on lane 22. And doing a lot of deep breathing. You can, you can hear him as he's got the microphone. talking to lane 22 that's what he wants he's striking on lane 21 he wants to strike to double up on lane 22 yeah, see he's talking to that lane now is that lane listening he never listened to me well, that lane is winning at the present time and ryan schaefer in the seventh frame and a 10 pin solid 10 for schaefer Made the proper move on the lane, continuing to go further and further left. Watch that ball as it rolls over the that's over wow over the sixth arrow. That is deep, folks. It's almost playing 21. Hard and straight. Not a lot of hook for the spare. And no problem. Staying in the hunt is Ryan Schaefer through seven frames. He trails by 16. And it's College Hoops with the man. All right, Dickie Pete. Joined by Digger Phelps, Jay Bonas, and oh yeah, former Cab Brad Darty to preview the upcoming college basketball season. Dick features his diaper dandies, primetime players, and lots more. So start off your college basketball season with the best tonight at 10 o'clock on ESPN. And right now, who is the best? The champion of champions trying to bring it back. One, two, four, ten. Searching for carry. 
hitting the pocket, not being able to strike, and now he leaves himself a difficult washout and a must-make situation for Schaefer as he's down by 20 pins, even if he makes this. I think uh, Couch knows that, uh, first of all, we'll wait and see what Schaefer does, but uh, should Couch strike in the eighth? Well, he's got a bowl of his own game. Can't be worried about what Schaefer's doing. Saw that earlier in the first match, the 1 2 4 10, the head pin wrapping around the 10 pin. Technically made the proper shot, got the ball in the right position, but he wraps the head pin around the 10. What a great shot. Frustration and almost knowing his fate is sealed. All right, Couch now on uh, lane that's giving him some trouble, Marshall. Well, just needs to keep hitting the pocket. If he keeps putting the ball in the pocket and filling frames, he's fine. He leaves the three, the six, and the seven. In a situation where all he needed to do was just make spares, he leaves himself a very difficult split. This ball's going to come in light. There goes the head pin barely. The seven pin stands, the three and the six for company. A makeable split must get the ball to the right-hand side of the three pin and kick it into the seven. If he doesn't make this, he'll be down into the 180s and Schaefer will have new life. And he makes it. And as Dickie V would say, that's awesome, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. Great shot from, from a champion, Jason Cow. He wants a re-rack on the lane 21. Let's take another look. He gets the ball to the right-hand side of the three pin. Almost overcuts it, Phil. Comes off the sideboard. Just nudges it out. And if you pick up things like that, it'll make you do stuff like that. Oh, it's fun to scream at the pins. You never did that. Of course not. Couch in the ninth frame. Needs to control his emotions. Put the ball back into the pocket. Get up. He did it again. Same shot as he Hold had down. in 22. Slow down. Telling himself to slow down. I said, you have to control your emotions right now. Fortunate just to leave the three pin. Ball coming in very, very light. Seven pin falls out this time. Leaves nothing but the three. Shouldn't have any problem making this fair. But as he gets closer to the final shots at this game and the possibility of becoming the first to, to ever defend the Tournament of Champions title, it becomes increasingly more difficult to throw the ball slow enough to make it hook back in the pocket. And even making single pin spares like that become more and more difficult. All right, Schaefer now, could he strike out? 189. Which would force Couch to mark and Ryan Schaefer up in the ninth frame. Must strike. Leaves the seven pin. The best for Schaefer right now. One, seven, nine. Couch just needs to stay behind the line. He can start doing a little bit of mini celebrating. Well, it's got to be a great feeling to know you don't need a mark to win the TSC. I, w I wouldn't know, but I can, I can, only, I can only imagine and, and be envious. <laughs> Shaper boy, what a great year, great performance here. His uh, first time in the Tournament of Champions. A memorable one. Well, and I made Ryan Schaefer the favorite. I said, yeah. I, thought, I really thought that he would go on and continue to dominate the lanes like he did in the previous game, but it looks as if it's going to be no more than one win for any one player during the four matches. Well, and we, this man, he knows, he knows right now that all he has to do is just stay behind the line and the emotions are starting to well up. He was, he was close to tears last night when he, when he struck in the 10th frame mm -hmm. to dislodge Norm Duke out of the lead position and now with the opportunity for two in a row, you know he's going to be very, very emotional. Four 
four and a seven for Schaefer. Well, you talked about Couch earlier, and Jason said he'll take a clean game. That's, and, and that's exactly what he's done. He's filled up all the frames. That eighth Ryan, frame, a key one. Ryan Schaefer with a couple of opens. And it's so easy to shoot 160 or 170 on these lanes this week. Second place finish it will be for Ryan Schaefer, Jason Couch. What a moment for Jason Couch. He's he, the winner. That's right. He's already uh, the winner of the Brunswick World Tournament of Champions. Oh, my. Back to back. TFC victories. That's a lot of pride. There's the first smile we've seen from Jason Couch. Going back to the demanding lane conditions. Boy, not easy tonight. As Schaefer finishes in the pocket, believes that stubborn 10 pin. It'll be 166 for Schaefer. Well, and for Jason Couch, there's so much emotion, it's probably tough.